forget your prize oh we crawl back to the cross and we thank you Break open your bottle of worship right now and allow it to spill on his feet and just thank him. God, we just thank you. We just thank you for, for your love, for your sacrifice. 
for your eyes of fire that look on us every day with holy passion. You're a faithful bridegroom. Thank you that, God, with all the works we do and that even with all you call us to do, God, you're not coming back for someone, Lord, in a maid uniform. God, you're coming back for someone, Lord, in a bridal gown. You're not coming back because of the works we've done or, or how well we passed the test of good works or, or everything we've done to serve you, God. You said that you no longer call us servants, you call us friends. God, you're coming back just because you're in love with us and you, you can't take, Lord, being apart anymore. Even though you're here with us, God, you're coming back for us to, to be with you in heaven to be with you face to face. God, you want to be face to face. Lord, as much as we can miss you and love you and long for you, how much more, how much more, how much more you are longing for your bride. You are looking on us with holy fire, with holy passion in your eyes. God, you never stop thinking about us. Our name is written on your hand. God, just like a schoolboy that writes someone's name over and over and, and thinks about her night and day and gets nervous about calling her. God, you're calling us and you're writing our name. God, it's always on your hand. God, you're looking at it and God, you're anxious to come pick us up. And we thank you that it's not a date, it's a marriage. God, you're, you're, you're forever. God, you're committed to us, Father. Jesus, how much you love us. How much you love us. How much you love us. Thank you, Jesus, for, for hanging there and, and God loving us with a love that said, how much can I pay to have this bride as mine? Whatever it takes, I'll give it. Thank you for that kind of love, Lord. Thank you for redeeming us. Thank you for redeeming us. Praise the Lord. Let's just lift up a song of love to him right out of your heart. Holy fire, God, not just the fire that, that touches us and we feel good and, and we're changed for empowerment, but God, the holy fire that burns in your eyes with, with passionate love. God, the fire that changes relationship, God. That's what we long for. The fire of holy love for you. The fire that, that is, Lord, the fire that is in your heart for your bride. Put that fire in us for you, Lord. Jesus, Jesus, show us your burning, show us your eyes, show us your love for your bride. Burn us with it, God. Look upon us and burn us with your holy love this morning. We want to love you more. God, we want intimacy. How great is the love of the Father that He has lavished it on us. He's extravagantly drenched us with His love. We're dripping with it. He loves us so much we can't even, we can't even keep it all. It's spilling out. Your love covers us, God. There's not, there's not any part of us, God, that isn't loved by you. Help us to love every part of your character, God. Just love him, just take another moment and just love him. God's, God's doing something in that area right now, just of holy passion. He wants to, to deepen your love for him. He wants to burn it a little hotter. He wants to, to ignite you with, with a more intimate love before you leave this place because that's, that's what will, will change your lives. That's what will change your lives. That's what will change your, your walk, your relationship, how you serve others. It's driven out of a holy, passionate love for Jesus. 
Lord, no striving or, or anything we try to do, God, we'll get it. God, it's all, it, it all has to be done out of love. God, it's all about love. God, ignite us with love. Just say that word love. Just ask God to ignite you with love. Jesus. Lord, let the, the holy fire of your love for us touch down in this place, God, and catch to our hearts. Jesus. God, we long for that kind of love. No other love will satisfy us, Jesus. Lord, what bride considers it a chore to walk down the aisle to her groom? God, deliver us, deliver us from, from, from religion. God, from, from trying to work our way to you. God, we don't get to you by works, we get to you by love. We get to you by love. Change our garments, Lord, change our garments this morning. Lord, we drop the apron and we put on the gown this morning. Just keep adoring him. Untame my heart, cause me to run wild and free in the love you have for me. And open my eyes, let me look upon. stop right here and explain why this song was written. I watched a conference video from Brownsville and one of my friends, Johnny Fernandez, was on the video and, and he was um, igniting the people to worship wildly and to jump and dance and shout. 
and, and he said, get wild. And the Lord spoke to me about our natural habitat, that when we were created, we were created to be wild, to, to not be affected or tamed by man. Our worship wasn't meant to be restricted by man. In our nature, I saw, I saw myself in just a big field out running and dancing and playing. There was no, no influence of man because no one was out there to tell me what to do or, or how to worship. It was just me and God, and I was, I was worshiping how I was created to worship. And so he ignited that, that definition of the word wild, what that really means in nature, wild. No one has tamed me. No one has told me how this is supposed to be done or how it's done in church versus home or whatever, that I was just created to worship, and that's how I need to do. And all the stuff that we've taught ourselves that wasn't of God and all the things that we, we say to talk ourselves out of really worshiping how is in our heart, how we're wanting to in our heart, that God wants to undo that. He wants to unwrap all that stuff and just get us in our natural state and allow us to be wild and free and worship him and worship him, how we were created to worship him. So that became a prayer, Lord, untame my heart. Whatever has tamed me and, and changed how you really wanted me to be, God, undo it. Just pray for God right now to undo you. God, just whatever has held us back, Lord, anything that's holding us back, any chains, God, any stuff, anything that has not been your influence, God, that is not natural, God, anything that you haven't placed in us, Lord, take it, take it, take it, take it, take it, take it, Lord, untie your hands, untie your feet. untame us. God, bring us back to the place we were supposed to be when you made us, when you saw us before we were even born, and you looked at us with love, and you said, this is how I want this one to worship me, and this is how I want this one to worship me, and, and this one's going to be a dancer, and this one's going to sing to the nations. This one's just going to quietly paint in the corner. This one will, will make costumes for the dance team. This one will pray and intercede at home and have a, have a special relationship that no one will see. This one will serve. This one will give. Whatever it is. Whatever it is. Whatever it is. Lord, deliver us from fear. Thank you for the word spoken over Lyndall last night. God, we just released that to him. And Lord, anoint his hands to untie the body of Christ and untame them, God. And, and Lord, dismantle the fear and place a mantle of praise. God, you're going to anoint him, God, to, to, to put on the garment of praise. Lord, to assist your body in putting on the garment of praise and taking off heaviness and, and religion and all that stuff that has tamed them and tied them up. God, he will be, Father, used as a vessel to set your people free to worship how they were created to worship, and God, to stir up and release the giftings placed in them, even if they're not giftings anything like we've seen or that we're used to. God, release the painters and release the dancers and release the intercessors, God, and, and all of the people that aren't seen, Father. God, that's where you are. You're in the hidden places, God. You're, you're not just up on a stage or, God, Lord, you weren't on a stage when you, when you paid your highest price. You were hanging on a cross naked and shamed. And God, there were no spotlights on you. And you had no microphone. And God, you were in pain and agony. And Father, teach us that suffering is also worship, God. And that, Lord, in our loneliest times, God, that can be our deepest worship. Because you're trying to draw your bride into you in a deeper place, God. Forgive us for resisting those times and, and, and not recognizing them as times of worship. Untame us. Just lift your hands and allow God to just let any ropes or chains or whatever, whatever's in your heart that maybe needs to drop, just ask him to, to allow that to fall at his feet. And then we're just going to take a little bit, a little bit more time and just worship him however he places in your heart. I don't want you held back or, or afraid this morning. I want you to leave this place delivered, delivered of anything that holds you back from worshiping him to the full. Thank you, Lord. And untame my heart, make this your prayer. Cause me to run wild and free in the love you have for me. Open my eyes 
Let me look upon your beauty as if it was the first time I'd seen it when we first fell in love. Let me see you again. Let me love you like I used to and renew my mind to the way it was before. Oh, my Lord, I want to think about you all the time and capture my gaze. Be my only love and my true passion. If only I can ask you this one thing.
there's no one but you thank you for what you did for us last night Lord every day Lord you've just given us more and more and we just thank you for what you're about to do for a grand finale we thank you Lord for Stacy Lord Lord she's a woman that's got her quiver full but Lord, she also has arrows that she shoots into the enemy's camp. Thank you for the gift that you've given us in this conference, all of our speakers, Lord. They have blessed us, challenged us, 
and our lives are changed because of their faithfulness to you. Lord, because they've given themselves as a sacrifice to you and laid down their life for others. Father, we truly treasure that today. We thank you, Lord, for their lives. Now, Lord, I pray for Stacy as she ministers that it will just come forth in boldness and in power. Thank you, Lord, for your anointing, the prophetic gifting that's upon her life. Oh, God, put the word of the Lord in all of our mouths, Lord. Let us be able to take it to the grocery stores, to the dry cleaners, Lord, to let them know the love of God and that you care that much that you would speak to a lost and dying world. Thank you, Lord, that you're changing us. And, Lord, I just pray as she travels home that she will just be so refreshed that she won't be weary, Lord, that a conference sometimes can uh, just cause you to be tired. L Lord, I just pray that she'll be energized, and I pray that somebody will go in and clean her house and that her kids will behave <laughs> in such a way, Lord, that she'll be glad that she went into her own house. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for a wonderful woman of God. Amen. Stacy, we love you. Um, I've just asked Jennifer to come up and finish sharing her little story there because many people asked her, well, what happened? So, uh, thank you. That was awesome. Hmm. Yeah, um, several people have come up to me and said, you never finished the story about the guys breaking in the room. So I just want to quickly finish that. Um, what happened was, um, you know, when you step out for God, there's a very real threat from the enemy against your life. And um, there was a sequence of events that the enemy just kept trying to take me out. And um, Stacey had mentioned that I had gotten really sick and nearly died, and God healed me. And, but the night I left the hospital, I was like, yay, God, you healed me, and uh, I went to this home and um, was, was on bed rest, and so I was staying in this room, and this was in Nairobi, Kenya, and I was all by myself, and it was actually Christmas Eve last year, and um, as I was laying there, I began to hear men's voices underneath my window, and um, within minutes, like, I just instantly heard the enemy, you know, I know, I told you, you know, I've, I've sent these men to rape and kill you, you'll pay with your life. And um, that was not okay. <laughs> so, um, you know, right then they began to break in, in the door. And there was about, there, well, what I could tell from the different voices, about five men. And um, I was actually just totally overcome with, with horror. I mean, fear. There's no word to explain. Wish I could say my response was spiritual, but it wasn't. It was just totally terrified. And I had no way to call for help. And I was all by myself. And I was actually still very weak. I um, had just come out of the hospital. So... Um, I felt total fear, and I just heard the Lord speak to me. And I want you to hear this, because I believe that this changed everything for me that day. God told me, God spoke to me, and He said, "Make a decision right now. Choose faith or choose fear. Hurry up; your life depends on it." And I didn't know how not to choose fear because all I felt was total fear. And I said, Lord, I don't even know how to choose faith right now because I'm so afraid. And at this point, they had gotten through the first door and they were now at the second door. And I just said, Lord, I, cho I choose to believe. I don't know. I choose to believe you can get me out of this. I mean, I have nothing else to lose here, so I'm just going for the faith, you know? Like, I'm just going to, I choose that one. And um, by faith, by doing that, like, I just, the promises of God were coming to me. You know, Psalms 27, we were just singing. Psalms 91, you know, about... You know, when um, the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? When evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, they'll stumble and fall. And um, I just began to quote the, the promises of God, and pretty soon there was just no fear left in me. Like, I literally just felt it disappear. And I was so confident in the promises of God, and this is going to sound really funny, but I actually was, was totally convinced that if they stepped in that room, God would strike them dead. And, um, like, it actually, I actually felt really sorry for them. And... Um, and so I, I was really convinced this was going to happen, and I was so confident in the promises, and, and I actually jumped out of the bed, which I couldn't even stand before, and was on my way to the window, because there was three at the window and two coming in the door, and the window was cracked, and I was on my way to tell them, you have five seconds to leave, you know, or God's going to strike you dead. 
and um, I knew that he would do it. And I actually, you know, I felt sorry. So um, it's kind of a funny story, Gideon, but um, on my way to the window, I'd never been in this room, and it was dark, and I slipped on a big plastic bag. I was on the floor that I didn't know was there. And I hit um, the desk, really weird noise between the plastic and the, uh, you know, and hitting the desk and whatever. And um, when the noise happened, the guy, one of the guys by the window jumped like that and it set off the motion light, which set off the dog barking. And um, so they couldn't figure out where the noise had come from. It was a really bizarre noise and they just freaked out. And so they just back and forth, they were, you know, somebody coming, I don't know, you know, the whole thing. And finally they decided they thought somebody was coming. And, and so they jumped over the wall. So I just praise God, yeah. Give God all the glory. But I wanna just really stress this thing, you have to know the word. You have to know who you are and you have to know your promises. And the things that are coming, let me tell you, it's gonna be worse than that. And in the middle of crisis, we have to be able to say, I don't even know, Lord, how not to be afraid, but you know what, I choose faith. And just hang on to those things and you'll see the, the redemption of God time and time again. So bless you. I just um, want to thank you so much for inviting me to this conference. I have been so incredibly blessed. Um, for those of you who are from this church, you, uh, you don't know how spoiled you are. And uh, you should, uh, I should make you feel guilty about that. Um, but I just really honor you for honoring the Holy Spirit. And it's just been a pleasure to see the... the, the purity and the, you know, the character of the leadership here, and I just really want to honor you. Like, when you just can stand by Brenda and feel love, you know what I mean? You just stand by her, it, like, comes out from her, and uh, it's just been just wonderful for me to be here. I do feel totally refreshed, even though I can't sleep at night, because it's, she said, oh, what do you think? It's called Awake Deborah. So... <laughs> And, you know, I'm excited by Jennifer's story. You know, the Bible says three things remain. Faith, hope, and love. And if you ever meditate in the Bible on any of those attributes, they're all attributes of God. There is no one I know who has more faith than God. I mean, a lot of times we think, oh, wow, that person had faith, and they saw the dead raised, and, you know, but nobody I know has faith like God. You know, uh, Pat shared the vulnerability of, of creation, how God made himself weak, and then now he chooses to actually, you know, exhibit his character and his works through you and me. Now, that takes faith, sister. And then we fail. And he says to Peter, the one who denied him three times, said, I'm going to build my church on you. You know, God just has so much faith. You know, when we are faithless, he remains faithful still. He is unbelievable. And then there's love. And I really... You know, I've been amazed at the love of God. And some of these attributes, the attributes of God, you don't learn through success. In fact, most of the attributes of God, you learn through your own failure and your own weakness. Like, how do you learn faithfulness if everything's going well and, you know, or how do you learn faith when, when you have everything you need and everything you want and everything, you know, it's all laid out on a golden platter or silver platter? Like, how do you learn how to pray for the sick and raise the dead and, you know, live I I with no money? And how, how do you learn these things? You learn in the, the places of, the, of lack in your life. Hosea said, I will woo you into the desert. God said through Hosea the prophet, I will woo you into the desert. And there I will meet with you. And so, you know, Paul said, I, I, you know, I, I really have been so blessed at this place. And I was praying, and I felt, you know, that verse of Paul, he said, having so fond an affection for you, that we were well pleased to impart to you, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, not only the gospel of God, not only the words, but also our own lives, because you had become very dear to us. And... 
I just felt like sharing a little testimony of how I came to love Jesus so much. Because I was raised, I said, you know, in the Catholic Church, and when I was very little, about seven or eight, I had this dream where Jesus appeared to me. And in this dream, you know, I had been to this kind of daily vacation Bible school or something in my little village. I was born in Beachy, Saskatchewan. All right, Beachy, Saskatchewan. <laughs> Can any good thing come out of there, you know? I mean, it's about top, population 500, you know? Um, and um, <laughs> nobody, even people in Saskatchewan have never heard of Beachy, Saskatchewan. You know, it's a uh, well, very, very tiny little place. But... That's where I was born. And uh, I, I was raised there. And when I was about, you know, five, six, or seven, I couldn't have been more than seven because we moved out of there when I was eight. Uh, I, there's these Mennonites in town, and they hold these daily vacation Bible schools. And I went, and I saw a flannel graph presentation of where, you know, the, on the flannel graph, they had, like, Jesus and the little kids coming to Jesus. And I was mesmerized by that flannel graph. I thought, oh, wow, Jesus is so kind. Look at how he lets all those little kids come to him. You know, he tells all those adults to just back off, and he just lets all those little come to him. Jesus is so kind. I remember sitting, looking at that flannel graph, thinking, you know, I just wish Jesus would appear to me. You know, I would love to see Jesus. He's so kind. And a very few days after that, I had this dream where Jesus appeared to me, but he was not the Jesus of the flannel graph. In fact, in the dream, uh, you know, I... I, I suddenly heard that, you know, saw Jesus, and I looked up, and I started to run towards him, memories of the flannel graph running through my mind, and he began to speak, and he began to speak, and I had never read the Bible, you know, because, except for the, the things that we'd learned in Mass, but I'd never actually read it for myself, I couldn't read that anyways, and so I didn't know any of this theologically, but it was really like, like the voice of, of many waters, it was just a, like a thunder, I couldn't believe it, and so, and, and, and as I turned to run towards him, it was this huge giant Jesus, and I, when he began to speak, I just was filled with terror, I mean, terror struck the, the innermost part of me, and instead of like going to grab him, I just fell at his knees and just started shaking in the dream, and all he said was this, Christ has died, we used to say this in mass, Christ is risen, and the, the words just went all the way through my being again and again, and just like thunder, and then he said this, and Christ will come again. And I knew from that moment that Jesus was real and that he was coming again. And I spent my childhood looking for God. And I had at that time what I would call is an impartation of the fear of the Lord in theological terms. From that moment on, I knew what was right and what was wrong. I was the suck in my family. I was always telling on my brothers. I, you know, anything they did, I told on them all the time. And I was aggravated when my parents would not get them in trouble. You know, I was just like, I can't believe it. So many times thinking that my parents wouldn't do a good enough job, I would drag my little brothers into the bathroom, lock the door, and ream them out for whatever I thought they ought to have be reamed out for. So I played the Holy Spirit in my family, you know, <laughs> convicting them of sin, righteousness, and the coming judgment, you know. And, uh, and, uh, <laughs> but it was actually, you know, and uh, so I was always looking for God. And when I was in grade eight, I had this teacher, you know, start teaching me about evolution. And I stuck my hand up in grade eight and I said, but I thought God created the world. And this guy you know, who was a church member of some sort, you know, he said, well, actually, he said, God was the initiator of the Big Bang. <laughs> and so I went, okay, well, you know, and then I, I kind of developed a theology from that, that I, I guess God was like so far out there and so great, you know, I knew it was great, and that maybe, you know, I, I was just supposed to make my own way down here, and so, you know, for a couple of years, I kind of floundered, but when I was 16, somebody preached the gospel to me for the first time and took me to church, and actually it was my husband. He led me to Christ, you know, not, not I was by myself when I became a Christian looking at trees, because that evolutionary thing kind of threw me off for a little bit. And, and I remember one night I'd gone out to the ski and I was looking at these trees, and the trees were so beautiful, and they were covered with snow, and I was just like all by myself in the dark looking at those trees, 
And I just started thinking about how many kinds of trees there were, and that there were deciduous trees and coniferous trees and, you know, so, you know, evergreens and all the other different kinds of trees. And I thought, you know, how can there be a spontaneous bang for every kind of tree? You know, I mean, like, how, how can I, you know, I was, I was 16, but I wasn't stupid, you know? And then I thought, then how can there be a spontaneous bang for every kind of flower and they suddenly emerge? I said, it takes more faith to believe in that than it does to believe in God. I believe in God. And I became a Christian, like, right on the spot, on the snow, in front of a tree looking at the creation of God the heavens are shouting the glory of God oh you just look at it look at the ocean and the waves and the fish and the colors and the sea he is amazing he's just so beautiful you can I love to sit out in nature and just like worship God it's like oh it's just he's just so fast I just go out in nature and cry just looking like if that's what he made can you imagine his face that's just simply the work of his hands. And, you know, but this fear of the Lord thing, you know, was, you know, a great thing for me, but I became actually very self-righteous in it. And when I, you know, what I said, I was, you know, the Holy Spirit for everybody, you know, it was, that's not funny, actually. It's kind of sick. And um, uh, I, I was really self-righteous. And because God actually gave this to me as a gift, this ability to discern good from evil, you know, I was very hard on people who weren't good. I'd say, like, buck up. You know, like, you know, get a life. And when I was about 12 or 13, my dad, you know, uh, lost his business. It was a very hard time for our family. And he became an alcoholic as a result. And I would just go tell my dad. I'd say, Dad, you know, you can't do that. Stop. That's not right to do that. And my dad was just, just a, such a beautiful man. He's so soft. He never was violent. He never was angry. He would just be get overwhelmed with the cares and just go into his room and drink and then just go to sleep. But it was one of those silent things, you know, that nobody ever talked about in our family. Just the silent thing. And unfortunately, when I went to church, there was a lot of silence in the church, too. But I never knew it when I was good. You know, and then I got married and I, I you know, went for university for a couple of years and we took a year out and I got married to my husband who's fresh off the, the mission field from Africa and he went to Bible college for his first year and I was my third year university. And, you know, at this time, uh, a very odd thing happened to me. I went to a Christian barbecue and uh, <laughs> that's not odd, but this is odd. Back then, 20 years ago, I was uh, 20 years ago, 20 years old at the time my third year university, and I walked into the bathroom of a Christian, at, at this Christian barbecue I'd gone to, and I saw somebody throwing up in the toilet. And instead of thinking, that's, like, what are you doing? I didn't even question it. It was almost like I can, I can remember it to this day. It was almost like something jumped on me, like from that person to me, just saying, Whoosh. and I, I thought, you know, that's a good idea. You know, I'm gaining a little bit of weight lately. That's a good idea. I should do that. And so, in, you know, the next time I ate, I actually went into the bathroom and I threw up. And I never heard of an eating disorder. I didn't know what an eating disorder was. At back then, it was not like a public thing. I'd never heard about it. I'd never read it. I didn't know anybody did such a thing. I didn't even compute that that person, person must have done it. So I, I didn't have anybody to ask, no frame of reference. But within two to three weeks from that point, I was severely bulimic. I mean, I hit it like, not like, you know, uh, uh, slowly. I hit it running. <sighs> you know, just t throwing up in the toilet two, three times a day. I was married. I was in my third year university. And to make matters worse, my husband was the preacher. and He was the itinerant preacher in the, in the church. He was in his first year Bible college. And he's kind of obsessive compulsive, you know, at the, at the best of times. And so at that, you know, at that point, this was his obsession. He was practicing rejoicing every day. And so he would come home and, and people would walk up to him and he'd say, and say, you know, a normal question like, how are you doing? He'd say, Philippians 4, 4, and thank you, you know, and, you know, rejoicing in the Lord. And I mean, he's just like, he's just so, uh, you know, uh, out there. He's just, you know, if you ever meet him, he's just a really flamboyant kind of charismatic guy. And, and so he was like, Philippians 4, 4, and I was, you know, just, just, you know, not in a good place. And I was, I, 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 I took a double major in French and German, so I was studying like Sartre and Nietzsche and all these existentialists and all these philosophers at the time in French and German. I was like, I was confused. And so, um, 
And plus I have an eating disorder, you know, that I don't even know what it is. I never heard a label. I didn't even know what it was called. And at first I didn't think too much about it, but because I was so severely bulimic within three weeks, I thought, no, this is not good. See? Oh, very discerning person that I am. <gasps> this is not good. And so I'd say, you know, this is sinful. The Bible says, you know, and the whole time, I want you to know this, the entire time, I'm praying every day, I'm reading my Bible every day, I'm being a good Christian, quote unquote, I'm the preacher's wife, I'm going to church morning, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, we're doing youth camps, we're doing the whole nine yards. You know, my husband's in the ministry and I got my doily on everywhere I go. And I'm like thinking, I remember, you know, going into church thinking, no, oh, this is not good. I probably need some help. And I remember going into churches, you know, looking, sitting there and thinking, oh, you know, this, this looked, and I wanted to find somebody that looked like they had a problem. Because I didn't want somebody that was, you know, doing real good because I knew I wasn't. And so I'd look around and see if it looked like there was anybody in church that had any problems. Because nobody ever talked about problems. And... Uh, nobody from the front ever said they had any problems. And, um, you know, they were all in their places with bright, shiny faces. And so I just, I was, you know, in this cone of silence, just like I was in my alcoholic family, in this cone of silence, where you couldn't talk about it. And I remember after, I was so ashamed, though, and so shame-bound, that after a couple of months, I told my husband, I said, Wesley, I think there's something wrong with me. I said, you know, I'm just throwing up. He said, what? And I said, uh, you know, I told him I'm just throwing up, you know, a couple times a day. And I just eat. And every time I eat, I just go in the bathroom and I throw up. Then he said, he asked me a couple questions. He said, this, and he said, this. He said, well, he said, we just studied that in church history. He said, the Romans used to do that. I, don't, I wouldn't worry about it. Now, counselor, he is not. You know, counselor, he has never, ever done any counseling in our church. He hates counseling, you know, he just, you know, bless him, Lord, bless him, you know, but that, that, that's not his forte. So, I mean, that didn't help me either. And so, I, I mean, this went on two months, three months, four months, and after a while I began to think, well, maybe I'm not even saved. You know, how can I be sinning? The Bible says, and every time I would pick up my Bible in the afternoon to read it, instead of like bringing life to me, it would just condemn me. And every word would just like, you know, even, even verses like this, nothing will separate you from the love of God. And a little voice in my head would go, except sin. And you're sinning. Ah, I am sinning. If a man be given a glutton, he let him put his knife to his throat. You know, all these verses would just haunt me. And I was just like tormented. I began to not care what I look like. I began to, you know, just, I was just, you know, I was just, you know, go, you know going through the motions, going to university. And I was like, ah, and I didn't know. And I was just so confused. Five months, six months, seven months, eight months. And at, uh, on the eighth month, sometime during about the eighth month, I, we went to this Mennonite brethren church. And they didn't wear head coverings, but of course I did. And I put mine on. I was in the front row. And there was a guy singing, and he was singing about the love of God. You know, and he just started singing about the love of Jesus. And at that point, I had another vision. It was only about my third one in my life. And you understand, I'm Plymouth Brother. I don't have a grid for these things. And... Um, and I had this vision of Jesus over top of the, that worship leader's head, that singer's head. He was doing a concert. And, you know, Jesus, he just like suddenly appeared there. I, and I looked at him, and he didn't speak to me. But all I felt was wave after wave after wave of love. It was like, you know how his voice went through me like, the, like a thunder? Well, that love went through me. It just went all the way through me in waves. And, and I, I couldn't believe it. I, I thought God hated me. I was at the point where I thought God couldn't like me because I was sinning every day, two, three times a day so badly. And he just gave this, this love to me. And he didn't say anything for about 15 minutes. And I started sobbing. I was a wreck. I was like, <gasps> I was like hyperventilating, crying. And then... The audible voice of God spoke to me and he said this. He said, if you do that, because I didn't even know it had a name back then. It was about five years later till it started coming out in magazines. But Jesus said this to me. I remember the words to this day. He said, if you do that till the day you die, I will still love you. I mean, who, who cannot love a God like that? And I had become a Christian because it was true. Because 
it wasn't evolution, it was creationism, because it was right and it was true. But I felt like I got really saved that day, you know, and that I was rooted and grounded in love. And do you know that the symptoms of bulimia dropped off, but it took me about eight months to walk out the mindset that had developed and the theologies and the things that held me bound to that addiction. And, um, and the Lord began to teach me, see, Stacy, what the Bible is for. See, you see, when you're tempted by the devil, well, how did I handle it when I was tempted by the devil? You know, he even threw scriptures at me. And I would rise up and I would say, it is written, it is written, it is written. And I destroyed the works of the devil just by using the word of God. And I just, you know, he began to show me. And I walked out of that addiction alone with nobody teaching me, me, the Holy Spirit, and the Bible. The Holy Bible. And I love the Bible. I have to tell you, I love the Bible. I love the Bible. I put verses everywhere, you know, for months. After that, I put them on my covers. I put them on my doors. And, you know, if every time I would have a temptation, I'd say, God always causes me to triumph in Christ Jesus. There is no temptation that is overtaking you, but as such is common to man. I just, like, quote scriptures at the Bible, and it just, like, pretty soon the devil got tired of tempting me. He got tired of the word. He just kind of left me alone, and the whole thing just disappeared. But I tell you, I learned to love the Bible. I learned, I learned all about Jesus through the Bible. And sometimes, you know, I would just kiss it before I would open it. I, I felt like David, I, how I love your law. It's like honey to me. And I eat it. And, um, you know, I, I, so, but to me, this book is not a list of do's and don'ts anymore. It's like, it's like, ah, I know there's something about him in there. It's like a date, you know, like. And, 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 you know, you even, it just, I started with certain scriptures and went to others, and I finally hit the book of Leviticus. And, you know, I couldn't understand it. And, you know, I, I couldn't understand it. So what I did was I got this guy who had his master's from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem that was in our church. I said, will you please take me through the book of Leviticus so I can understand it? Because I knew that God put it in there for a reason. And I knew there was something of him that was a treasure in the book of Leviticus. And if I could just get it, I could find out more about him. And, you know, I'm a woman, and I have a house, and I like to decorate my house. And I would go through all those things that he put in his house. And, like, why do you think he liked that? And, and the, this Hebrew guy was trying to tell me. And I would ask him all sorts of questions that he didn't have any answer for. I'd say, why do you think God liked that color? Why do you think God put that there? Like, what do you think he likes about that? And, you know, this guy was like, stumped he didn't you know know all the symbols or anything either and so I, I just would go home and I would read it and you know I remember one day I thought you know what I, what I discovered after about eight months of Leviticus is I discovered that God loves holiness like he loves holiness he just like everything about him in his house I mean you wash your hands you clean it's just because there's just something so awesome about his holiness and and the purity of the garments that they put on there and and, and the holiness you know they, they didn't have the blood of Christ then and, and he just loves holiness so I thought one day you know what I'm gonna do I, I know that I've got the blood of Christ but I'm just gonna I'm just gonna pretend I'm a priest in Leviticus and I'm going to have a date with God, and I'm going to have a shower, and I'm going to wash my hair, and I'm going to put on perfume, and I'm going to put on a white dress, and I'm going to, you know, paint my nails, and I'm going to get ready, and I'm going to prepare myself just like those priests did to enter the Holy of Holies once a year. I'm just going to get myself ready and just kind of put myself in that place. And I remember I did that. I made a date, and I got this frankincense and myrrh, and I lit all these candles. Women, we like that. And I... I uh, uh, Got, got these little candles and I lit it and I just imagined going in and I took out my Bible and I was all alone and I said, Lord, where do you want me to read? And he just began to impress upon me certain parts of his word. And the first thing he did was he, he, he rebuked me, actually. He said, you know, if your brother has something against you, first go and be reconciled to your brother. And I thought, oh, yeah, 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 okay. And I reminded me of this relationship that was kind of out of whack. And so, I, you know, I went and did that and but it took me a little while to see the person. It was about three weeks before I did that again and I got in my white dress and I had my shower and I washed my hair and I did all that and, and I, I went back and I, I only did this twice in my life but at that second time when I when I did that, this little spiritual exercise, uh, the Lord gave me just one of the most amazing promises that's a life 
promise. It's a life scripture for me. That every time now when I ever feel afraid or I ever feel concerned, like that's that psalm, it just comes and it washes over me. And, you know, it's just, it's promises by these exceeding great and precious promises. And they're not just for me, they're for everyone who loves him. And so I'm going to be a little practical today because, you know, we talk about the secret place, we talk about intimacy, and we, we talk about these, these spiritual words, but, but sometimes we don't really know how to get there. Like when you leave this conference, how are you going to get there? And today I'm going to give you like some, the way I got there. I'm going to show you the way I got there. Uh, and it's a passion of my husband and I is to teach people, you know, the, what God told Joshua to do, to meditate on the law and discover him. So I want to play a CD. We want to teach everybody to do this. We teach our children to do this. I want to play a, a video of my, my daughter Vashti actually praying the Lord's Prayer. We teach our children to pray the Bible. And this, she actually prayed this prayer, like recorded this prayer when she was four years old. In the video, she's seven, and she just turned eight last month. But um, you'll see a little picture of her. But I want you to just watch this video as an example of what I'm going to teach you. It's the Lord's Prayer on the, on the video. And um, anybody can do this, what I'm about to teach you. In fact, every Christian, you know, for thousands and thousands of years, for over 3,000 years, the pathway to spirituality has always been praying the Bible, meditating on the law. And, you know, the children of Israel under Moses did it. Joshua did it, David did it, the prophets did it, Edra, Ezra codified it, Jesus and the Jews of his era did it, the early church did it, all the saints prayed the Bible. I mean, I like to read the saints. In fact, I spend, you know, a, a lot of time reading uh, the, the, the saints, uh, uh, you know, like St. Teresa of Avila, Brother Lawrence, uh, St. Teresa of Lisieux, uh, many, many, many of the saints. I, I love actually to read the saints. And when I, what I find out is that Madame Guillon, all of them prayed the Bible. And all of them, their relationship with God began to flow out of the revelation that he gave us about who he is. And you see, we, we have a, a, a book of revelation of who he is. This book is all about him. And eventually, after you pray the words of the Bible, they will lead you to the author of these words. Eventually, you know, if you do it long enough and if you search for him and seek for him, you cannot help but discover him. Not just the do's and don'ts, the reason, the, the personality, the, the, the heart behind every jot 
and every tittle of this book. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. And so, um, uh, I feel like, though, that a lot of people don't really know how to pray. My husband didn't know how to pray. He had to learn to pray because when the Holy Spirit fell on us in 1987 and 1988, when we were Baptists, yes, I'm telling you, Baptists, at a Christmas party, nobody asking for it, nobody ever having experienced this before. When the Holy Spirit fell on us, one of the first things that he said, he said, you got to pray. And my husband, at that point, didn't know how to pray. Now, I actually knew how to pray. Do you know how I learned how to pray? I learned how to pray because I was the dumbest one in church. When I was 16 and I walked into that little Plymouth Brethren church that my husband took me to, you know, it was a very small church. It wasn't a big church like this one where you could kind of get lost in the crowd. Everybody had their Bible. Everybody had been taught every Sunday school story. You know, I was so dumb when I went to church that I didn't even know that there were like subdivisions to this book. I, I just said, Holy Bible on the front, you know? And then the preacher would stand up and say, okay, would you open your Bibles to the book of Philippians? And I would go, Philippians? Oh my goodness, I didn't know there was a Philippians in there, you know? And um, there was a little tiny church and they were all old. And, you know, I'd look to the person right of me and left of me to see, like, is it at the front, the middle, the back? And, you know, and I'd be looking at what, but I found out that there's page numbers at the front. So that was a big help to me. Because I didn't learn that song. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. I hadn't learned that song. I had to learn that song in my late teens or early 20s to, in order to find out where the books of the Bible were. And the pastor would open it, the, the preacher would open it. They didn't believe in pastors, so they had, like, rotating speakers. And he would open it, and he would start expounding. And I'd go, wow, I didn't know that was in there. That's awesome. And I, I love it. And I said, I'm going to try this at home. And I'd go home by myself, and I'd look it up, and I'd go, Paul. Oh, my goodness. Who was Paul? And I didn't have a clue. And so all I had was a Bible that my husband had given me. We weren't married yet. And, and a concordance. It had a really good concordance. And it had colors, you know, red and green and blue, and, and all coded in there. And so I could find out little certain things from that. And I looked up the concordance, the word Paul. And I began to search the scriptures for a Paul. Who was Paul? What did Paul do? I found out about Paul's conversion. I found out that he you know, was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, circumcised the eighth day, all this history about Paul. I, and, and I found out how he got saved by the blinding light, and I'd find all that stuff out, and then I'd go, okay, I kind of got that in my mind. Paul and Timothy. Oh, who's Timothy? You know, I have to do the whole process over again. And it would literally take me months to get one through one verse, and I'd get to the next verse. Bond servants. Bond servants. What's a bond servant? And I find out all about bond servants and, you know, the Old Testament, you know, if you really loved God, if, the, you know, if a slave didn't want to be free, you know, he could pierce his ear with an awl, he could go before the judge and, you know, he could be a bond slave. And then I'd say, okay, Lord, now make me a bond slave. And I'm 16. I say, Lord, if Paul was your bond slave and Timothy was your bond slave, I say, Lord, like, make me a bond slave. And I began to pray, and my whole identity began to be formed, not by my family, not by my culture, not by anything, but by the Word of God. God began to teach me who I was in Him and who He was in me. By meditating on His law, by being the dumbest one in church. Bond servants, bond slaves. And so I just would start praying that and, and until it actually, you know, I felt like I actually attained it. And I would not go off of the word until I actually felt I could do it a little bit. I mean, certain chapters, I don't know if you've ever tried to pray through the Beatitudes. <laughs> but anyway, I have tried that. I've, I've taken several runs at that, you know, months at a time through the Beatitudes. And I haven't quite, quite attained to that. But, uh, but I watch people as Pat. I, you know, I, I told Pat yesterday, I said, Pat. I don't think I've ever seen you sin. You know, I have seen her hurt. I have seen her wounded. I have hurt her. And I don't think I have ever seen an ungodly response come out of her mouth. I was like, okay, okay. You know, that's why I want to be like her when I grow up. I feel still like James and John, sons of thunder. Wow, ah, should we, somebody offends me, let's, you know, pull down lightning from heaven and let's zap them and, you know, you know, I like those guys. They make me feel better about myself, you know. <laughs> but prayer 
And one thing about prayer is you have to, first of all, the first point is this, you have to learn to pray. Jesus said to his, one, the Jesus disciples, they were watching him pray, and they suddenly, by looking at him, they said, Master, we don't know how to do it like you do it. Obviously, there's something very different about the way you pray and the way we pray. And so they came up to him and they said, Master, teach us to pray. Like John taught his disciples to pray. You've never taught us. And John's disciples are praying all the time and fasting all the time. And we see you're praying all the time. And we obviously don't know how to do it. So teach us to pray. And they had to learn how to pray. So you don't have to feel badly about this if you don't really know how to pray. You know how you go into a prayer meeting and there's some of those just eloquent intercessors and they can just go off? And they can go on and on and on and on and on and on. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, and suddenly you just feel intimidated in those prayer rooms. You think, ah, I don't even know how to pray. And the only time that you feel you can connect with God is when you go to church. Sisters, these things ought not so to be. My best times with God are alone at home in a room with His Word. In fact, sometimes I find it distracting. I mean, a lot of conferences I go to, it's more of a distraction than, than a presence. But here it's been so beautiful. I've just been so refreshed in the presence of God. Just meditating on it, being, you know, with the, with the body of Christ. But really, my best times of prayer have been alone or in very, very, very small groups when I've just been praying alone. That's where my greatest revelation comes. And we all have to learn how to pray. The disciples had to learn how to pray. I had to learn how to pray. Many years later, my husband had to learn how to pray, you know, when the prophetic word came to him. And we all have to learn how to pray. So let's just settle that. That's point number one. And the second thing is, is that it's going to be hard work. We have to determine that we are going to work at prayer. Prayer is one of the hardest disciplines that you will ever do. It's one of the greatest, most fulfilling. But I bet there's warfare on that area of prayer in your life. The devil does not want you to pray. I mean, have you ever gone to prayer and then suddenly you're just so sleepy? You carve out the time, you get there and you're just like, you know? Don't, don't worry about that. Just persevere in prayer. You have to learn how to work at prayer. In the scriptures, it talks about people that were prayer giants. They like labored in prayer. Labored in prayer. Fervent intercession. Labored. Do you know how many? I, I, I've been in labor five times. I don't like labor. In fact, one time after the first one, I had the elders of my church anoint me with oil so that I could have twins, so I could have two babies, one pregnancy, one labor. I thought that would be good. I did not like the entire experience. You know, I'm very short. I was very fat. You know, I just, the baby went like straight out like this. I remember my, my legs got so tired. I was so exhausted when I had pregnancy. I thought if I could only have two babies and one pregnancy, that would be heaven for me, please. And they actually did, and, but it didn't happen. One by one by painful one. And I remember the first one. I was in there, you know, and I'm, my doctor knows I'm a Christian because, you know, he just, he's been our doctor forever. And so he, he was there when my husband and I got married. He's, he's been through the whole thing of our life, and he knew I was a Christian and he wasn't. So I was trying to be a good Christian in labor and I, and, I, and I was doing pretty good you know for a while till 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 actually labor came it was just those Braxton Hicks I didn't know. <laughs> and then suddenly labor started coming and I you know I lost it I totally lost it uh, you know I that I was this tell you you know it's not good you do drugs you don't do that natural labor I didn't care give me anything they got you know but I was too far gone so all they could give me was that gas mask and so I remember them you know Wesley was so watching me and he was like so concerned about me that he kept putting that gas mask I'm like get that gas mask off my face you know and I'm just like doctor you know and um <laughs> And finally, Wesley couldn't take it anymore, so he put the gas mask on his mouth. <laughs> I have loved it to see men get hit by the Holy Spirit and go into intercession. <gasps> like, vengeance is the Lord's, you know. <laughs> and after, you know, I was done. Uh, a good friend of Pat and ours is Donna Bromley, and she used to be a labor, uh, you know, a, a nurse in, in labor. And, and she said that it was just awful watching all these ladies go through labor. And, and they said, you know, to, you, what, what was it like? Like, what was it like to be in there? And she said, well, she said, you want to know what it was like? She said, this one lady said, you want to know what it was like? Yeah, to her husband, you want to know what it felt like? She says, well, just take your fingers. And... 
Spread it like this. I hope you can't see that in the video. And then she said, now, just slip that over your head. Ladies, five, five, five times. <laughs> but labor is, I mean, I mean, labor, prayer, it can be hard work. Just like labor. Prayer is not an easy thing to do. And it takes, you know, discipline before delight. The Bible says in Hebrews 5, 7, that Jesus, when he prayed, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears, uh, you know, to the one who could save him from death. Now what kind of prayer, what kind of good guy goes to prayer and starts going with loud cries and tears? That's the kind of intercessor you want ever living to make intercession for you. Somebody who's into it. Somebody who believes in it. You can, does that, you know, my husband always says, does that mean you have to cry real loud and yell real lots to, you know, to pray? He said, no, you don't have to cry real lots and yell real loud. But that shows you that Jesus was into it. He was not like passive, like our, you know, North American posture. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray, you know, Lord, my soul to keep. He was into it. And you have to work at prayer. <clears throat> and the call to prayer, the Jews said, was they clearly understood it as the service of the heart. And I'm not going to have time to go through all of these things very, very uh, in depth because I want to have a little practicum at the end. So I'm going to rush through these, but they are in our book, um, Pathway to Spirituality. And you can read, you know, lots of history and, and uh, Jewish prayer and how the Jews prayed and, you know, the whole thing behind the, the wailing wall. You know, why do they pray like that? Because they work at prayer and they found out that when your body is into it, so is your, so is your, it's easier to enter into it in your spirit. And that when you lie down, in fact, North American prayer posture is absolutely the worst kind of prayer you can do. Sitting down silently, one by one, while somebody else prays. At least in Korea and some of the other countries, they all pray at the same time so that everybody is into it. And the Jews, when they pray, they actually move their whole body. So it's whole body prayer. They're praying, they're reciting the law, and they're, they're you know, Wesley always says they go like this so that if they fall asleep, bang, they hit their head, you know, keep going. <laughs> but I know the whole thing of movement in prayer is very, very important, and you have to work at it. You have to get your body into it. You have to stand up. You have to walk around. You have to call. You have to, you know, express yourself. A little a while ago, a couple months ago, I was at a YWAM base, and I woke up in the morning, you know, and it was such an oppressive spirit around that. I was talking to the YWAM leader. He said, oh, yeah, it's in this area. We've been doing spiritual warfare on that, he said, for, for a long time. But it was so oppressive. The last thing I did was feel like praying. But I got into that prayer meeting, and I forced myself to yell. I just started calling out, God is great. God is good. You know, and then I just started declaring the names of God. I started saying, you're the healer. You're the deliverer. You're all powerful. I just started saying all the attributes of God that I could think of. And I just shouted them out and walked around the room. And, you know, pretty soon I was totally into it. And so was everybody else. And we can take people up with our prayers and we can take them down. And, and that when you get into your prayer, when you actually move, when you actually, you know, focus on who you're talking to and, and talk to God, it makes a big difference. The third thing is you have to set a time and make a place. You know, when you um, go to meet people, and we do this all the time in church, we say, oh, you know, yeah, we should get together sometime. Right. And you never do. You know why you never do? It's because, not because you don't like each other, not because you don't have a desire to get to know that person, not because you don't have a desire to spend time with that person, because you never actually schedule it in. Mike Bickle always says, he said, the greatest deterrent for prayer is schedule. People will make a schedule. They will write it in their day timers. They will write it in their books. They will write every other kind of appointment in their, in their book, but not their prayer meeting. Not their time with God. It is not written down. 
But I'm telling you, if you began to take your day timer, to take your little Palm Pilot, to write on that thing, okay, you know, 9 o'clock Monday morning or 7 p.m. Monday night, you began to schedule it in. When somebody asked you, what are you doing on such and such a time, you say, well, I'm busy. I actually have another appointment. And if you began to schedule it in every single day, you would begin to just connect. And simple, pragmatic things like that will keep you from prayer. If you don't make the time, if you don't make the place, it ain't going to happen. And in the, God knew this. In fact, God originated daily prayer. Not out of legalism, but just so that every time that, you know, we would have a, a time to meet with him. In, in fact, in the last, the first, the, what he gave to Joshua when he entered the land, he said this, Joshua 1.8, you shall meditate on the law when? Day and night. Now, why do you think he said day and night? Like, what does day and night mean? All the time. Morning till night. You know? Which actually means if you say, okay, we're going to do it every day, all the time, 24-7, you know, that really means you're never going to do it. Right? Because you also, you know, have babies to feed, a job to go to, something to do. And pretty, if you think you're going to do it all the time, that's not going to happen. You know what morning, day, and night means? It means in the morning, in the day, and in the night. In the morning, and in the night. In fact, it, all through the Psalms, you will find this practice being practiced by David. David says this, As for me, I shall call upon God, and the Lord will save me. Evening, and morning, and noon, I will... Complain and murmur, and he will hear my voice. In the evening, in the morning, in the noontime, he met with God. Daniel 6.10 said, three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed. According to Jewish history, Ezra codified the practice of thrice daily prayers with a reading from the Torah. The intertestamental period, they continued the practice, traditional Jewish prayer. Actually, even Jesus did this. He became obedient to the customs. Luke 4.16 says this. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue as was his custom. It was customary for Jesus to enter. You know, he, he just entered into the customs of the day. And uh, it will show that Jesus followed the same time-honored practice of going to synagogue every Sabbath, etc., etc., now, Jesus, that Jesus observed the standard practice of Jewish prayer is without question. It is also true, listen to this, that Peter, James, John, as well as Paul, and every other New Testament personality who was of Jewish or origin also did the same. Acts 1, Acts 2.42, Acts 3.1, Acts 6, Acts 10, summary. You know, they met, you know, regularly. They were going by, you know, when did Jesus heal the lame man? On their way to the temple at the hour of prayer. It was already established that there were set times of prayer in the temple. They did it, you know, just their regular customary habit was to go to the temple and pray. And the Didache affirms this, you know, in the, in the early church, the church fathers affirm this. In fact, the whole of, of Christianity begins to adopt this Celtic Christianity I mean, they took this to an obsession. Some of those iron men in the, in the Celtic church, they would pray the, the, three, the three fifties daily. That means that they would pray through the entire book of Psalms every single day. Think of what happened when they got to Psalm 119. And there are three times of prayer some of them, it has in, in, in the history books, that they took up the practice of the three fifties every day. Most of them, all the monks, prayed through the whole book of Psalms every week. Every week. The church was built on prayer to God. In fact, the Muslims copied all the Christians and their, in their, in all their tenets of Islam. Their creed which says there is only one God and Allah is his name, that's what their creed says, is copied from the Jewish practice of reciting the Shema, Deuteronomy 6.4, where they say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. They copied us. They, they copied
copied the daily call to prayer with the prayer caller. They used to have that in the, in the Christian church. Prayer five times daily, the praying of scriptures. Fasting through Ramadan is modeled after fasting through Lent. Prostrations is modeled after Christian form of bowing down. Daniel bowing, you know, in front of the window. Facing Mecca is copied from facing Jerusalem. A holy pilgrimage to Mecca is patterned after a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, you know, like in Psalm 84. Even the Muslim prayer beads are copied from the Orthodox Church. Now, they do every day, five times a day, by law, what Christians won't do by grace. They will go meet with their God five times a day. And we won't, maybe sometimes we'll go a week without actually talking to him. And, you know, God just wants us, God, God's just a very relational God. You know that? You know, you, you love having coffee with your girlfriends. He loves it. Just, we just go and we sit in his presence. And, you know, sometimes it's, it's words. I always take my Bible. Teresa of Avila used to say, I could not pray without a book. My mind was so scattered and so distracted. It took a book for me to pray, you know? And so, I mean, that's how my brain is, you know? Um, because, you know, I have five children and I've lost my brains. <laughs> and that's a medical fact. I read this study from Harvard University that there is actual memory loss in pregnant and lactating mothers. And if you have your children spaced, you know, more than uh, five years apart, your short-term memory loss does not come back until that much time at the end of it. And I figured that, I counted that up, okay, and I had mine two years apart, and you know, I multiplied that exponentially, you know. I figured I'll be going senile by the time my brain gets back. <laughs> so I have to have a book when I pray. I have to have the Word when I pray. I cannot pray without the Word. Besides, I'm still... One of the dumbest ones in church. I don't understand half of that and what that means. You know, because it's not just words to me. It's like, how do the words take on life? And there's so much of these words that I don't do. I don't know about you, but there's like, oh, I'm ashamed to say how much maybe relatively I could maybe do in this book out of all the words that are in there. You know, and God wants us to become doers of his word, not hearers only, deceiving our own selves. You know, I hear those stories of, of Heidi and then, you know, she prays for the blind. And, and, you know, she watches their eyes turn from white to pale to dark. And I go, wow, you know, that's in the book there. It's in that book there. These signs will follow those who believe. You know, and I used to kind of, you know, she said last night, like, Prayer, like a headache, is the same as a wheelchair, and I believe that. I mean, I believe that. In fact, you know, when I started thinking, realizing that God actually healed today and talked today, you know, I just would go for wheelchairs. I would just walk right up to the wheelchairs, and, you know, and I got so discouraged because nobody in the wheelchair ever got up. In fact, I had, woo, woo, I had people that I prayed for. You know, even the headaches. I had headaches that I prayed for that I would go eagerly up to them the next day and say, how are you doing? And they said, I got worse after you prayed for me. I got worse. And I got so discouraged in the area of healing that I went backwards. And I just thought, well, I guess I can't really do this. And yet I'd have all these prophecies. You're going to heal the sick and there's going to be a mantle of healing and blah, blah, blah. And I'd, so I'd, you know, try again. But I got really intimidated from healing. So, I, like, you know, I, I just want you to know that we can all start somewhere. Until finally the Lord showed me this principle. He said, Stacy, you know, maybe you should be faithful in a few things. Faithful in the little things. And then God will make you faithful over more things. So I, 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 now I specialize in headaches. <laughs> and actually, I have to tell you this, that I actually stopped praying for the sick because I got so intimidated, uh, you know, that my faith actually decreased instead of increase for a, a long season there, that I, but I just forced myself to start doing it again. Okay, I'm going to pray for the sick. I'm going to be faithful in season and out of season. And, and you know, I'm going to just pray for words of knowledge for healing. And, you know, this year since January, I have prayed for so many people, and they've all got better. I have all had so many testimonies. And, I mean, this is 15 years into it, where I had testimony that everybody got worse or nobody got better at all. And this year, I hit some. They got there. 
and I've been praying for words of knowledge for healing. I was in Russia, and uh, uh, there was this guy there um, that could, could heal the sick, and so he was doing this, and, and I prayed for a word of knowledge for healing, and the Lord gave me one, and this was it. Short ribs. I was in short ribs. I thought, oh dear, you know, Russian culture, short ribs. I said, Lord, what does that mean? He said, well, there's somebody there. He said, it's not actually the rib that's short, like I thought maybe they had a broken rib, and it, you know, but it's, you know, the muscles around it have kind of atrophy and blah, blah, blah. So I shouted out that word, and this lady stood up, and, you know, that she had short ribs, and I thought, oh, I go on one, yeah, you know, and then, and then, you know, they prayed for the healing, and she was just going like this, and at the end, they said, who got better? And she goes running up, and not only that, another lady comes up behind her and said, and when she called out that word of knowledge, I had it too, and they both got healed. So there. And my faith is just beginning to grow, little by little by little by little, because God loves me. And, you know, God, God, you know, God, he gives talents the way he wants to. That's up to him. Some he gives five talents. Some he gives two talents. Some he gives one talent. Praise the Lord if I got one talent. Bless God for my talent. You know, but the one that actually didn't do anything with their talent, I was afraid. So I just hid my talent. Do you know what Jesus said to that at the end of the age? He said, you wicked, lazy servant. Now, you know, I don't think that sounds very nice. But God actually wants us to do something with what he's given us. And does it matter if we only have one talent? Does God require multiplication of one talent the same way he requires it of five? Yeah, he does. And in the church, sometimes we enable the one talent people. I know what it's like to enable addictions. And sometimes a false mercy comes on us and we say, oh, that's okay. You don't have to do anything. We'll give it to the person who does everything. That's not the way the kingdom works. We're all doing it together. And if you don't do your part, it just makes more work for another person. But you know that five talent person, that person that's been faithful, you know, they're gonna be, fa if they've been faithful with five, they'll be faithful with 10. If they've been faithful with 10, they'll be faithful with 20. And you know what, because it's not about us anyway, it's all about God and he can give talents any way he wants to and we just get to participate with him. It's his work and his kingdom and praise God, I got one talent and I'm gonna make two and then I'm gonna make four and six and eight because I love him and he's so worthy. He's so worthy. The other thing is you need to pray the Bible because these, you know, 1 Corinthians 2.13 says, this is what we speak, not in words taught to us by human wisdom, but words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. If you don't pray the Bible at some point, I mean, there's all forms of prayer, there's petition, etc., etc. But when you pray the Bible, you will actually hit the zone of God talk. You will actually begin to pray about different things than you normally would pray about. We tend to reduce our prayer lives to our own little concerns and, you know, Aunt Mabel and, you know, the, the kids the kids and this and that. We, we, we reduce our prayer world. And when you turn to the Bible, heaven and earth and, you know, anything. I remember praying through the book of Revelations years ago and I'm, I'm re-praying through it now. And I remember getting to the part where it says, you know, that, 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 I better look that up. I remember praying through the part where it says that the, in Revelations chapter 7, these are the ones who are before his throne. And they have um, white, white garments. Let's see what he does. Da, 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 da. He said, who are these? And, you know, those who are clothed in the white robes, who are they and where have they come? He said, my Lord, you know. And, uh, and then he goes on and says, these are the ones they serve him day and night in his temple. They're before the throne of God and they serve him day and night in his temple. And I read those words. God, that's what I want to do in heaven. God, I, I, you know, I used to hear things about all the things people would do in heaven and they would rule and reign. And I said, I, I don't care about, you know, ruling over Jupiter or anything like that. I just, I just want to be before your throne. I just want to serve you day and night if you're, you know, if you want thirsty. I, I, don't, I don't know what you, you don't eat or drink up there. I don't even know what you do, but... 
I just want to be there. That's where I want to be in heaven. What do you have to do to get that job? And I said, oh, these are the ones who have come out of the Great Tribulation. <laughs> and I've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And I went, oh, that didn't sound good to get that job in heaven. You know, and I, and I remember I went, I'm, I'm a little crazy. So, but I got kind of off on this one. And so I started praying, oh, God, you know, you know, I really want to be before your throne. I really want to serve you, but I, I you know, I hate pain. And, and, and I don't really know if I could do that. And, and I, I was just like, I was starting to obsess on it. And then I thought, okay, no, could I do that? You know, could I be martyred? You know, I faced the martyrdom question. Could I be martyred? And I thought, I could do it. I think I could do that. If they gave me a bullet through the head, if they said, okay, you know, well, you shoot it through that. And then, I mean, I'm going off night after night, of, you know, in front of this verse. I'm going off night after night thinking, okay, I think I could do martyrdom if they shot me through the head. And then, what about torture? And then I thought, oh, no, what if they rip my fingernails off, you know, pull them off one by one. And, and I started thinking of the worst excruciating type. I've read Fox's Book of Martyrs, you know, and I started thinking about all those uh, you know, by their blood and that new one, Jesus freaks, they got out there and I started thinking of all those tortures and I thought, what if I can't do it? Like, what if I get to the very end, you know, and they're pulling off my fingernails and I recant. Ah! And I was just going off and off and I was, you know, really all by myself in my room, just, just going off like this. And I got, began to totally discourage myself thinking I wouldn't be able to withstand torture, depending on the degree of torture they gave me, to be martyred, to get that job in heaven. And I was, oh, no, 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 no. And I was just going off and the Lord spoke to me so clearly. I had, you know, the inaudible, audible voice of God. I can hear the intonation. I can hear it all. And he said this and he said, it's kind of like, have I been with you so long? You know, like one of those kind of tones, you know, a uh, sort of rebuking tone. He said, it is enough for me that you die daily. And I had this flash of revelation that I was always waiting to do some great thing for God in the sweet by and by. Well, why didn't I just do something today? You know, why didn't I just take what was in my hand and do it today? My small, my little things with great love. And it was uh, revolutionary for me to just do that. And then there's pray out loud. That usually helps most people. Although uh, silence, most people say when you get to the place of silence, you're hitting the pinnacle of prayer. But you usually can't get to mountain peaks without going all the way along about praying out loud in fact there's so many scriptures on meditate what meditate means it's a verbal prayer that's why the jews kind of mutter when they pray and you know i could i'll just you know list things this this is the word haga uh, meditate comes from the hebrew word haga which means job 27 4 utter it's translated all these different ways. Psalm 1, 2, meditates. Psalm 35, 28, my tongue will speak of your righteousness. Psalm 37, 30, righteous man utters wisdom. When men tell you, Isaiah 8, 19, tell you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, that's the word haga. Isaiah 31, 4, this is what the Lord says to me, as the lion hagas or growls over his prey. You know, mourn, mutter, these are translations. Meditate. Mourn, imagine, mutter, roar, soar, speak, talk, study, utter. All those are transliterations of the verb haga, which means it's an out loud verbal thing, which is why they do it. People talk out loud at the wailing wall. Do you know what I mean? Blessed is the man who does not walk in the council of the ungodly. And they say those things because they say it out loud because it actually helps them to focus And when they're talking. My husband always says, it's hard to think about something else when you're talking. And so if you're, you know, using your vocalization, it really, really helps you at some point. But, you know, then you go to silence at the end. And silence, silent prayer is usually the prayer that, that I do just because I, I, that's how, how I, I learned it. And, you know, in that place of prayer, of silence, after you've learned to mutter and talk and talk to God, always focusing on God, you know, we're not talking to each other when we pray. We're talking to him when we pray. That there's something that you reach in silence in prayer. 
It's like people that have been married for a long, long, long time, and they really, really love each other. And you hit that place when you don't even have to speak. But I'm telling you, if they started out their marriage that way, not speaking, they'd never hit that end place of not speaking. And so we go through all these things until, but it's not one that's better than the other, but all of it is so that we actually learn to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our strength, with all our soul, with all our might. That's all we have to do. I don't call you servants anymore, but friends. You are my friends if you do what I say. Well, how are you going to know what he says? You just pick up your word and just start doing it. So I wanted to have a little practice. I'm going to make you practice. I am a mother. And I've learned that if you don't teach them to do it, they never do it. It's always head knowledge. So I want you all to stand up, and I'm going to give you a little exercise. <clears throat> I want you to take out your Bibles.